Shalom, I'm Tony Robinson of Restoration of Torah Ministries, and we're going to continue our teaching from Parashat Shemot, uh, the very first Torah portion in the book of Exodus. It's entitled Exploring the Beauty of Parashat Shemot, Part 2. And in this uh, teaching, we'll be looking at Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 22, and the Midrash, the Jewish Midrashim, about that verse. So what's so unique about Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 through 22? Well, the first thing that we're going to talk about uh, in this teaching is its literary structure. In other words, we're going to look at Exodus 1, 15 through 22, and we're going to look at how it is arranged, uh, 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 how it is arranged in its literary context. How is it arranged? What kind of thematic patterns are present? And then uh, after we do that, we're going to uh, answer some grammatical questions. There are certain uh, nuances or peculiarities in the text that hint at uh, other events that may have occurred. And so we want to look at that and we want to try to, try to just gain an understanding how we need to be uh, keen observers of the text so that uh, we can pick out these little nuances and try to gain a, a better understanding of what's happening. Uh, thirdly, we're going to look at uh, Midrashim, Jewish Midrashim. Midrashim. We're going to try to uh, lay some foundation for understanding them, uh, why they came about, whether or not they're true, what are we to do with them, how do we deal with them, especially when they uh, fly, uh, when some of the uh, statements of the Midrashim fly in the face of the literal reading of the text. Uh, and then lastly, in this teaching, we're going to look at a midrash on Moses' birth. This is a midrash on his, on, on his birth. So as I said, the first thing that we want to note is that Exodus 1, verses 15 through 22 is told or written in a thematic pattern. And uh, the pattern that it's written in is called the chiastic structure. We've talked about this numerous times, so I'm just going to breeze through this. But remember, in a chiastic structure, a story is divided into two halves. And uh, the themes of the first half, theme one, theme two, theme three, and theme four, are repeated in the second half in reverse order, theme one, theme two, theme three, and theme four. And then uh, the two halves of the story point to a middle section, which is called the central axis. Now, <clears throat> before we just before we go through the themes of the story here, I'm going we're going to read through the text since it's a short text. We're going to read through it and just kind of uh, give an, an an outline or overview of how uh, I was able to see that this was a chiastic structure. Okay, so let's go ahead and analyze <clears throat> uh, Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. Uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to read through it, and we're going to look at some of the themes and see how you can um, determine that this is a chiastic structure. So we'll start reading right here in verse 15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king, what the king of Egypt told them. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile River, but let every girl live. Now as we read through this, there was there were a couple of very obvious uh, phrases that repeated, and so again, remember the, the 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 text of the of the Bible are written in thematic patterns, and so what we're looking for are similar themes, similar words, similar phrases, similar circumstances, etc. 
So let's go ahead and note a couple that stand uh, that stand uh, out quite immediately. Uh, for instance, right here, when it says, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. What we'll see is that uh, if we come down here to verse 22, notice what it says here. It says, then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but every girl let live. And so what we see here is that we have a similar theme right here. Okay, if you see the baby is a boy, kill him, but if it's a girl, let her live. And that right there compared to uh, then Pharaoh gave this order, uh, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. So right here we see themes that have repeated, okay? Now, I'm going to go ahead and this is all part of one sentence, then Pharaoh gave this order and said, so we'll go ahead and highlight all of that. And we'll go ahead and highlight um, all of that in yellow. So here is our first theme that we can see here. Now we're going to look uh, for another theme. It says uh, at one point, um, uh, as far as the midwives are concerned, it says here, uh, da, 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 where can we find this? Right here it says, the midwives, however, feared God. Okay. So let's do that. Let's, let's highlight that. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt told them to do. Okay? So let's just say that they feared God right there. Well, that theme repeats itself in the second half because right here it says, and because the midwives feared God. Okay? And so there is that theme again. So you can see the beginnings of a chiastic structure working here where we have theme one and then theme two, and then in reverse order, we have theme one and theme two. So that uh, just kind of gives you a little bit of the thought process uh, behind finding this chiastic structure. And so with that, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and uh, look at the chiastic structure in a little bit more detail. Okay, so let's take a closer look at this chiastic structure. As you can see here, we have uh, three themes on each side of the story, and then uh, one in the middle, which is the central axis, verse uh, 19a. And again, as we read uh, chronologically, uh, as we go chronologically down, we're just going through the verses 15 through 16, 17, 18, all the way down to 22. But what we're going to find is that there is a thematic pattern superimposed upon the chronological uh, development of the story. So we're going to look at the first two themes. Uh, I'm, well, I'm sorry, the first theme, which is uh, theme A. And remember, uh, the, the first theme in the first half of the story becomes the uh, last theme in the second half of the story. This story is divided in half right here. Okay. And so every theme here will repeat here in reverse order. So let's go ahead and look at the first theme. In uh, verses 15 through 16, we're going to read where it says, Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. And he goes on to uh, give them a command. But it says the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. That's thematically connected in the second half in verse 22, where it says, So Pharaoh commanded all his people. Okay? Speaking to the Hebrew midwives is thematically connected to commanding all his people. And we can see the clear connection there is that Pharaoh is communicating to people. Okay, that's a, thematic connections can be as simple as that. Now let's note the second thematic connection that links Exodus uh, chapter 1 verses 15 through 16 with verse 22. Where it states, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. That is thematically connected to uh, verse the same theme in verse 22. Every son who is born, you shall cast into the, into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Okay, and again, the thematic connection is clear, objective. Anyone can see those connections. And remember, as I said, that as you begin to study thematically, that anytime you think you have a thematic connection, they should be clear and objective. 
um, so that your average person can see them. Uh, if, if you have to go through a lot of mental gymnastics in order to uh, uh, say that A is thematically connected to B, then most likely they're not, okay? It's very objective. Uh, this is a very objective uh, way of learning. Okay, so let's go to the second theme that's connected in this passage, verses 17 and then 20 through 21. And we'll see uh, that there are two themes in this passage. It says, But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. So this phrase right here, the midwives feared God, in verse 17, is thematically connected uh, to this phrase right here, because the midwives feared God, down in verse uh, 20 through 21. Okay, and again, we see a clear objective theme. It's, it's simply the repetition of a phrase, midwives feared God. Those are some of the easiest thematic connections for you to see when it is repetition. However, we do see a second theme in this passage. In verse 17, it says, but uh, uh, the, the midwives, it says, but they saved the male children alive. Okay, saved the male children alive. That is thematically connected to, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. Okay, now what's the connection there? Okay, again, this one is a little bit more difficult to see, but it is still obvious once pointed out but saved the male children alive. In other words, the male children, um, they were kept alive. Uh, and so therefore, the children of Israel continued to grow uh, in multitude faster than if they uh, would have killed the male children. If they killed the male children, they would have uh, increased in multitude much slowly for two reasons. Number one, there wouldn't have been uh, as many children born, since the, uh, only the daughters would have been born. And secondly, male children are uh, would help uh, the reproduction process. So clearly, saving the male children alive is thematically connected to, and the people multiplied and grew mightily. So that's our second theme. And then our third theme is theme C, connecting verse 18 to verse 19b. And um, Pharaoh says, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? Now that is thematically connected to 19b where it says, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Now, <clears throat> this is another nuance of uh, thematic connection. Sometimes in the first half of a, of a chiastic structure, you will have a question. And here we see the question is, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? Okay, so Pharaoh is asking a question in the first half of the, of the chiastic structure. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, quite often enough, uh, a question which appears in the first half of the, of the chiastic structure is answered in the second half of the chiastic structure. So right here, when the midwives say, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them, that is clearly the answer to Pharaoh's question in the first half. And so this is a very beautiful way, a uh, very beautiful literary technique for uh, showing how the question was answered. But I want to also, um, uh, let you know that this actually hints at something deeper as to how chiastic structures function and some of the practical utility for a, a chiastic structure. It's been my experience uh, that this uh, little, uh, this, 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 uh, what we've just learned here is actually has, becomes the basis for a deeper teaching. In other words, uh, we said that a question was asked in the first half of the chiastic structure and it was answered in the second half of the chiastic structure. This becomes the paradigm for the following statement. Many times you will have something in the first half of a chiastic structure that you do not know the answer to or that you do not understand or that will not be clear in the first half and in the second half once you find uh, the thematically connected statement in the second half, the question, it will answer the question in the first half. It will make clear uh, what was unclear in the first half, uh, as, you, as you can see. 
So in other words, just as in this example, a question was asked in the first half and answered in the second half, so likewise, there will be examples of chiastic structures where there will be something in the first half which is uh, not easily understood, but it will be understood once you find its thematic connection in the second half of the chiastic structure. Again, I've seen this a number of times, and as we go through uh, some of these audio, audio visuals, you will see examples of those. So let's continue. And then we, we make it to the central axis, which is Exodus chapter 1, verse 19a. And it says that the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, okay? Now there is a teaching lurking right in there, uh, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> Maybe some of you will know. But uh, I just wanted to present this chiastic structure, uh, the basis for it. And so the next thing that we want to do, now that we see that this, is, uh, this passage is uniquely marked off and identified by the Holy Spirit, and I want to emphasize that, that this passage right here uh, that this chiastic structure that we've just uh, uh, that we've just uh, studied, it has been prepared for us by the Holy Spirit because He is the one who had the prophets uh, pen, and particularly Moses in this case, He is the one who had Moses write this story in this literary pattern. And as I've said before, if He wrote it in a literary pattern, He did it so that we could see it. And so uh, we, we want to uh, enjoy the beauty of Adonai's word. Okay, so now uh, the, the question is this. Uh, let's, let's, look at, let's look at a midrashim. I want to talk to you just a second about a midrash. Uh, the midrashim, these are embellished stories pertaining to the biblical texts, okay? They're embellished stories. In other words, um, the masters of the midrash, uh, the sages of the past, um, they went beyond the literal wording of the text in scriptures and they filled in more details uh, in these stories and they call them midrashes. Um, for, and I'm going to give you an example here uh, of, uh, of, of one of these midrashim. Now, in my next book, I'm going to deal with the midrashim uh, in depth. But for right now, I just want to say that these midrashim are not to be taken literally. They are not to be taken literally. Uh, they are uh, stories that were developed uh, by the sages of Israel. And uh, hopefully as we go through this lesson here, you'll understand uh, why and how they did this. But for right now, what I want to do is I want to read to you a, a midrash uh, pertaining to Parashat Shemot, specifically uh, the birth of Moses. So uh, this uh, next paragraph is taken from the Midrash Says, the Midrash Says, which is a uh, uh, five-volume set uh, for each of the books of the Torah, uh, which uh, discusses Midrashim. But this is what it says. It says, during that time, the Egyptian astrologers appeared before Pharaoh and announced, we foresee that the Redeemer of the Jews is about to be born. We are not sure, however, whether he is Jewish or Egyptian. The astrologer's vision was obscured since Moshe, although born from a Jewish mother, would be raised by an Egyptian. Okay, so this is a Jewish midrashim uh, pertaining to the birth of Moses. Okay, now let's continue. What I want to do is I want to read to you uh, what Rashi says about Moses' birth. Reading to you from uh, Rashi's commentary, it says, He, meaning Pharaoh, uh, decreed upon the Egyptian people, too, that their newborn male infants be cast into the Nile River. For on the day that Moses was born, Pharaoh's astrologers told him, and you see the astrologers again, see? Uh, so the Midrash that I told you before was not specifically Rashi's, but now we're, we're dealing with Rashi's. But you see the same concept here about astrologers. For on the day that Moses was born, Pharaoh's astrologers told him, Today Israel's Savior has been born. But we do not know if he was born of the Egyptians or of the Israelites. And we see that his destiny is to be stricken through water. Therefore, Pharaoh decreed for that day 
uh, upon the Egyptians too that their newborn male infants be cast into the Nile. This is indicated by the conclusion of the verse as it says, Every son that will be born into the river, you shall throw him. Okay? Uh, and let's see here. But the astrologers did not know that the meaning of... Okay, so that's all I wanted to read. So in other words, <clears throat> Rashi has a very similar uh, Midrash. And again, uh, as I said, the Midrashim are not to be taken literally. Uh, but there is uh, a lot of uh, wisdom in these Midrashim. And we're going to see uh, later on how these Midrashim quite often are not too far from uh, messianic truth. And we're going to understand, hopefully we'll understand why. But the question I have now is, uh, why did the Jewish sages feel the need to invent this Midrash? Okay, This Midrash that astrologers foretold uh, to Pharaoh of the birth of a Jewish, or actually it should be an Israelite at that time. But anyway, um, why did they feel the need to make up this story about astrologers foretelling Moses' birth? Okay, And not only that, not only why did they do this, what was the basis for them saying this? What was the basis for them saying, yeah, well, astrologers came and, and they foretold the birth of Moses, okay? And, uh, and, and why is this Midrash particularly important, okay? So we've already noted how, how, how Rashi built upon the, the, the Midrash. But what I want you to do is I want you to notice the following fascinating themes from the Midrash, okay? I want you to think about these themes uh, from, that I'm going to present to you now from the Midrash, and I want you to put on your thematic, think, thematic thinking caps and see how close they relate to things uh, spoken of in the Gospel. Now listen to this, because again, we know that these Midrashim, that they are not literal and that they are made up by the sages, uh, but we need to... We need to uh, we need to step back and think now, now how did they do these things? Because, as I said, sometimes they're close to Messianic truth. So let's, let's look at this right here. Um, Pharaoh was told, today Israel's Savior has been born. Okay, so here we have a Midrash, and in this Midrash, it's a story about a king. I'm, I'm just going to make it very generic here. It was specifically Pharaoh was told. But I'm just going to make it generic so you can make the connections. A king was told, hey, uh, the Savior, and that's exactly the word that Rashi uses as Savior. Um, the Savior of the Israelites has been born. I want you to think about that, okay? He said that astrologers said that Israel's Savior had been born. Notice that it was astrologers who reported the birth of Israel's Savior to Pharaoh. Now think about that, because astrologers are those who watch the skies and watch the stars. Hint, hint. Okay? What else can we see? Male children were killed at the time of the birth of Israel's Savior. Did you know that when Moses was born, what was happening to all of the other male children in Egypt? They were being thrown into the Nile River. So as you can see, the Midrashim aren't far from truth because what I want to do is we're just going to, we're going to go back one slide and we're going to notice where it says Pharaoh was told today uh, Israel's Savior has been born. Uh, was not Herod told that, uh, that the Savior had been born? He that was born King of the Jews. Remember that phrase? And weren't uh, there wise men? who came and reported the birth of Israel's Savior to, to Herod. Remember that? In other words, we already, as you can see, the Midrashim aren't far from the truth. Let's go ahead and skip down here. Well, no, let's not do that. Let's go ahead and get back here. In other words, and were not male children being killed when you, around the time of Yeshua's birth? So if I were you, <clears throat> and I'm not, but <laughs> I'll just play like I am, I would think that you would be very interested in how this Jewish Midrash could be so close to the truth of what actually is reported in the Gospels, okay? 
In other words, how did they come up with this? I mean, this was thousands of years before Yeshua was even born, and yet the major themes surrounding his birth, which are not written specifically or explicitly in the text, except for, except for obviously, the, the children being killed here, but this idea of astrologers foretelling the birth of the Savior of the nation, uh, <clears throat> and that they uh, were astrologers, that they were watching the skies, uh, I think that's pretty fantastic and pretty amazing that uh, the Jewish Midrashim would be so close to the truth of what we see in the gospel. But what do we already know about the story in Exodus 1 through 2? We already know, if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you've been studying with Restoration of Torah Ministries, you already know that Exodus 1 to chapter 2 is messianic because of the sign of the Messiah. And I'm not going to go through that full teaching here, but basically you know that one of the things Adonai has shown us is how to know when we are in messianic prophecy. And the birth of Moses uh, in Exodus 1 and 2 is clearly messianic. We see the sign of the Messiah, which basically is this. Anyone, anytime you see anyone, a messianic figure, well, at least this is how you tell they're a messianic figure. When you see someone who was brought to death's door, there's no way they're supposed to live. For all intents and purposes, they're going to die. That is a picture of the death of the Messiah. And then for some inexplicable, inexplicable reason, they, they wind up living. That's going to be your picture of resurrection. And in all of these stories, you will see the number three. Most of these stories, you will see the number three, because the number three is the number of resurrection. And we see this in the story of Moses' birth, because when he was born, he was supposed to die. He was supposed to be cast into the Nile River uh, to his death. And his mother put him in a little basket, and she helps complete the picture of his death by putting him on the Nile River, where he wasn't, in the natural, he wasn't supposed to live, right? And then we see the number three in the story because his mother had hid him for three months. So this story already has all the earmarks of messianic prophecy. So what I want to do is just is share this with you. So at when when Yeshua was born, there were all of the male babies two years old and under in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas, areas were being slaughtered by the decree of Herod. And we see that at Moses' birth, male children were being executed. And so if you remember that in John 5, Yeshua said, this is what Yeshua said, Moses wrote about me. Okay, Moses wrote about me. And so in our Torah lessons, we show you how Moses wrote about Yeshua. In other words, when Moses wrote about his birth in Exodus chapter 1 through chapter 2, he was actually writing a prophet. He was writing about the birth of Yeshua. And just as male children were being killed at the birth of Moses, it was a, actually a prophecy that male children would be born at the birth of the Messiah. And then if we read in Matthew 2, 2 through 4, um, the, the wise men, when they say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? That is thematically connected to our Midrash, where the astrologers, where Pharaoh, where the astrologers say that they have, uh, they have, that, that they have seen, uh, that the stars have told them that the Jewish Savior was born. Okay, clear connection. And then right here where it says, for we have seen his star, when the wise men said we have seen his star, it's because of astronomy, not astrology, but astronomy. In other words, these wise men, they have been watching the skies and the stars. And you remember it says that the star had guided them. So they were watching the signs in the, in the skies. And that is exactly what happened with our Midrash. In our Midrash, it was the astrologers, the ones who watched the signs in the skies, who came to Pharaoh and said, hey, uh, the deliverer or the savior, as Rashi put it, of the Jews has been born. Okay, and so um, again, we see that the midrash is so close to truth. Okay, so what's going on with these midrashes? Okay, the Jewish sages, what they were trying to do is they were trying to answer questions raised by the text. Okay, they were trying to answer questions raised by the text because, as you know, in biblical stories, quite often. Uh, a lot of details are missing. 
And so they were trying to fill in the details. All right, so let me give you an example. Example. The Midrash says that Pharaoh asked, and this is another part of the Midrash that I'm going to give you here. Another part of the Midrash says this, that Pharaoh asked his three counselors for their opinion on how to deal with the Jews. Because remember, the problem was that they were reproducing so much. Now, in context, we're, we're, we're taking this back to Exodus 1, where he had asked the midwives to uh, slay all of the male babies, and they didn't do it. And so Pharaoh's perplexed now. He's like, now, how are we going to how are we going to curb this this population growth here? And so uh, it's, he, in the Midrash, they say that he asked his three counselors. Now, one of the counselors in the Midrash is Jethro or Yitro in uh, Hebrew. Remember uh, Moses' father-in-law, Zipporah's father. Uh, so again, this is just a Midrash, and this is not literally true. But in the Midrash, they ask. Uh, Pharaoh asks uh, <laughs> Yitro, one of his advisors, and says, you know, hey, what are we going to do with these guys? Now, listen to what Jethro suggested in the Midrash. As you know, he declared, whenever we attempted to harm the Jews in the past, we became the losers. You recall that the late Pharaoh who detained Sarah for one night was stricken with a plague. So was Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Furthermore, it is our duty to remember the debt of gratitude we owe Joseph, which obligates us to abstain from any evil plans against the Jews. Jethro watched the growing displeasure on the king's face and realized that it portended danger for him. He hastily made his exit through a rear door of the palace. From there, he fled to Midian to escape from Pharaoh's wrath. Okay, that was taken from page 12 of the Midrash says. Now, <clears throat> where did they come up with this story? Okay, well, what I want to do is I want to deal with the passages that are, are highlighted in yellow uh, because what I want to suggest to you is that the basis of this story comes from this. They made key thematic connections to other texts which then provided the basis for the Midrash. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Because, again, you know, we can prove a billion different ways that the sages of antiquity, that they thought thematically, they understood chiastic structures, they made thematic connections. We did that in, in, the, in part one of this lesson. But listen to this again. They made key thematic connections to other stories in the Bible, okay, to other texts in the Bible. Which then, now they made those connections, and then they made connections to those other stories, and then they took elements of those stories, which became the basis for the Midrashim. So let's look at one here, where it says, Pharaoh, who detained uh, Sarah for one night, was stricken with a plague. Now he's clearly, this, he's clearly, Jethro here in the Midrash is clearly recounting the, the, um, uh, the incident when uh, Abraham and Sarah went to sojourn in Egypt because of the famine in the land of Canaan. And you will remember that Adonai sent plagues on Pharaoh uh, because he had detained Tara, Sarah. He was trying to take Sarah into his harem. Okay, well, what's going on here is that um, whoever the writer of this Midrash was, they clearly made a thematic connection between they clearly made a thematic... Con let me just skip ahead here. I want to see something here. Um, okay, let me go back. All right. They clearly made a thematic connection between the children of Israel being in Egyptian slavery and bondage and Abraham and Sarah being in Egypt. Just as the children of Israel were actually betrothed to Adonai and Pharaoh didn't know it, so likewise Sarah was married to Abraham and Pharaoh didn't know it. Pharaoh took the children of Israel who were betrothed to Adonai as his slaves or servants. The other Pharaoh took Sarah to be his servant. She was going to be one of his wives in his harem. Uh, you will remember that Adonai sent plagues upon Pharaoh uh, in order to have Sarah released. And in our Torah portion, he's going to be sending plagues upon the Egyptians to release the Israelites. You will remember that when, when Abraham left Egypt, he, had, he left with much of the wealth of Egypt uh, that, that Pharaoh had given him on behalf of Sarah. 
so likewise, when the children of Israel leave Egypt, they will plunder the Egyptians. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the writer of the Midrash, he made a clear thematic connection. He understood that he because he understood that the story of Abraham's descent into Egypt was actually a prophetic it was actually a prophecy or a prophetic picture of what would happen to the children of Israel later on. This is why when you look in a Jewish Bible and you read the topic or the heading over Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 10, I believe it is, it's going to say Abraham's exile. It's not going to just say Abraham goes to Egypt. It's going to say his exile. Now, he wasn't literally exiled. It was the children of Israel who were exiled. But they connected the uh, the picture there. And, and clearly, Adonai wanted us to do that. And also, they went ahead and made another connection. Because when Jethro says, so was Abimelech, king of the Philistines, well, he's already made a thematic connection to Pharaoh and Sarah, who are obviously pictures you know, of Israel. Uh, and, and the Pharaoh to come. And then he made a thematic connection to Abimelech, king of Gerar, because what happened? The same thing happened. Remember when Abraham went to Egypt and he said, uh, and he told Pharaoh, she's my sister. He did the same thing with Abimelech, king of Gerar. And so now, um, uh, Jethro in this Midrash, he brings up Abimelech, another thematic connection. All right, a, a third thematic connection, obviously, is he says here. In other words, what, what Jethro was trying to do, do is, um, you know, in the Midrash, Pharaoh has asked the three counselors, you know, for their, for their counsel. Jethro is trying to say, Pharaoh, you need to just leave them alone. And he's giving, them re he's giving Pharaoh reasons why. Now, the third reason he says is, look, we owe, we owe gratitude to Joseph because remember Joseph he uh, saved Egypt because he, uh, he, he knew that seven years of famine were coming. We saved grain and we were able to keep ourselves alive. So Jethro is saying, hey, you know, you, you need to leave these guys alone because Joseph, we, we owe a debt to him. So we shouldn't kill his people. And now look at what happened. It says that Jethro watched with growing displeasure on the king's face and realized it pretended danger for him. And it says he hastily made it through an exit. Now look at what it says. Is It says from there he fled to Midian to escape from Pharaoh's wrath. Now what does that remind you of? It should remind you, it should remind you of Moses. Remember when Moses had killed a man? And remember uh, Moses killed a man and he heard that Pharaoh had found out about it. He knew that Pharaoh was upset with him. And so he fled to Midian to escape Pharaoh's wrath. And now we have Jethro fleeing. Okay, so clearly whoever wrote this Midrash made thematic connections. And hopefully this, this helps you see what I mean by they make the masters of the Midrash made thematic connections to other stories. And then those stories became the basis or the launching point for the Midrash and how they embellish the story. OK, now, sometimes the basis for the Midrashim are taken from clear thematic teachings gleaned from the text. OK, it may not be a thematic connection to some other text somewhere else. It could be uh, something gleaned from the text. Uh, let me give you an example. In my teaching uh, on Exodus 1 and 2 on Moses' quote-unquote death at the hand of Yochevet, his mother. Well, I've, I, I've, when I teach the sign of the Messiah, I always use Moses as an example, his birth. And I state that when uh, his mother, Yochevet, when she put him into the basket that she was completing the picture of his death. Because, see, Moses was supposed to die when he was born. She put him in a basket and put him onto the Nile River. Now, in the natural, there's no way that he's going to survive. In other words, she has just basically placed him, uh, you know, and, and I say this in my teaching, that she placed, she basically placed placed him in a casket because there's no way in the natural that Moses is going to live. I also state that what she does is that she uh, provides a picture of Moses' death. And what I say is this. I say, well, what was supposed to happen to all of the male children who were born? And, well, they were supposed to be thrown into the Nile River. And then typically I'll say, what did Moses, what does Moses' mother do? What did Yocheve do? She threw him into the Nile River, right? In other words, she obeyed Pharaoh's command. He said, 
all male babies into the river, throw them into the river. And that's exactly what she did, even though she put them in the basket. Okay. In other words, she was helping to complete the picture of his death is how I teach that. Because what I'm teaching is that we need to see that Moses is a picture of Yeshua the Messiah. When Moses was born and his mother placed him in the basket, it was a picture, a thematic picture of the death of the Messiah, where he was supposed to die. And then when Pharaoh's daughter drew him from the Nile River, that is a prophetic picture of resurrection. Now, what I want to do is I want to read to you from page 17, uh, a statement, another statement from part of the Midrash surrounding Moses' birth. And I want to prove to you that this whole idea that I've been running around teaching about, uh, stating that Yoheved, that she was giving us a picture of Moses' death, which is really the death of the Messiah, that teaching, those statements that I've been made, I want to show you that the masters of the Midrash, that they saw the same thing. And I'm going to read to you right here. Listen to what the Midrash says. It says, she took a little, now look at that word there, casket. She took a little casket and smeared the inside with, with lime <laughs> LME and outside with pitch to make it waterproof. Now, what does the text say in Exodus? It says that she took a basket. It didn't say anything about a casket. So why does the Midrash say she took a little casket? See, again, the Midrash, what they're doing is they're making a substitution of casket for basket. Why? The reason why is because they see the picture of Moses' death. They see that he was supposed to die. They see that his mother put him on the Nile River, which was surely plunging him to his death, even though she was hoping that he would live. And so what they did in the Midrash is they say she took a casket instead of a basket. So in other words, the basis of the Midrash is the text, the story itself. They didn't go to some other story like Genesis 12 when Abraham uh, descended to Egypt in order to get uh, extra informa information to build their midrash. They used um, inferences from within the text itself. Now, to further prove, to, to further prove that, uh, that they saw this as Moses' death, I mean, just seeing right here that they use the phrase casket in the Midrashim is enough, but watch this. It, the, the Midrash continues, Yocheved had good reason to deposit the chest in the Nile River rather than hide it in any of numerous other places. She hoped that the astrological signs would then indicate that the Jewish savior had been cast into the Nile and the Egyptians would abandon their pers persecution of potential candidates. In other words, the Midrash is saying that she, she could have she hidden, hidden Moses in any number of places in any number of ways. But the Midrash is saying the reason why she put him in the what they call casket and, and the reason why she put him into the Nile River is because she was hoping, right? She was hoping that the astrological signs would then indicate that the Jewish Savior had been cast into the Nile, i.e. that he had been cast into the Nile to his death. In other words, the Midrash is suggesting that she did this to simulate his death so that those astrologers who were going to Pharaoh would then say, well, the Jewish Savior has died now. We've seen that he's been cast into the, into the Nile River. Our plan has worked, so we won't kill any more Jewish uh, Israelite babies, you see. Now, of course, as I said, this is all Midrash. It is not true. These are not literal events. These are stories that the masters of the Midrash made up. But they used other biblical texts for the basis of the Midrashim, okay? So they're not to be taken literally, no matter what anyone from Judaism tells you, they're not to be taken literally. So what was the basis for developing the Midrash concerning the astrologers foretelling the birth of a deliverer, okay? In other words, there was a reason why they came up 
with this story that astrologers have foretold Moses' birth. And so what I want to do is I want to find out from the text why did they even think that they needed to make up this story about astrologers foretelling Moses' birth, okay? And this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at the text. In Exodus 1, 15 through 16, it says, Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra, da 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 And it goes on, you know, when you, if, it's a, if it's a boy, you shall kill him, a girl not. The key word I want you to look at is spoke. Now, this is what, uh, one quick thing. Uh, these two scriptures that I have here are elements A and our chiastic structure that we did earlier, okay? This is element A and our chiastic structure. Hopefully someone will answer that. <laughs> But uh, this is this is element A in our chiastic structure. And I just want to show you how the chiastic structure helps us to focus on these two particular passages of Scripture. It says the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. Now remember, this is his first attempt at infanticide. This is his, his first attempt to try to curb the population growth of Israel. Well, if we read down in Exodus 1.22, it says, So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river. Now, let's just compare and contrast. This is a thematic connection. Remember, this is one of the thematic connections that we saw in the, um, in, in the chiastic structure. We said that uh, the connection was that you have a king speaking to people. But now what we're going to do is we're going to look at what was actually said. In uh, 15 through 16, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. And he said, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, you shall let live. But notice he spoke. But towards the end, when he was not able to curb the population growth, it says he commanded his people saying, throw the, the mail. So in other words, we're looking at spoke versus commanded. Now, this is what we should inf we, we need to make, infer here. At the beginning in verse 15 and 16, when he told the midwives to kill the babies, um, obviously, a, a, well, you, that happened at some point in time. And then later on in verse 22, when he commanded that you shall cast them into the Nile River, Obviously, a period of time had passed. Some period of time, the text doesn't tell us, but obviously some period of time had passed such that Pharaoh saw that his original plan of trying to use the, the midwives was failing. So he came up with a second plan, okay? This is just obvious from the text. So the first time, early on, his first plan through the midwives, it says he spoke to them, but later on, he commanded and I want to suggest to you that there is a hint here that something has happened between the time that he originally spoke to the Hebrew midwives that they kill the male babies and the time when he commanded his people saying, you're going to throw these, Nile ba these babies into the Nile River. It is increasing intensity. Can we see that? It is increasing intensity to go from spoke to commanded. So the question is why? Why does it go from spoke to commanded? Secondly, it is a subtle hint at, is this a subtle hint at some type of increasing frustration on Pharaoh's behalf? And I would suggest so, because early on he spoke to the midwives, whereas later on, maybe some years later, he commanded. OK, it's a subtle hint that there's increasing frustration and it also signals a change in Pharaoh's attitude. And you just think, you know, uh, when you're not frustrated, you will speak to someone and say, hey, I want you to do this. You, it's a command nonetheless, but you speak to them versus when you begin to get frustrated, when things aren't going your way, then you just come out with a direct command. And so that's the first clue in our text that something's going on. Now, let's look at our second clue that something happened. In other words, what we're looking at, we're trying to figure out what happened between the time that Moses, I mean, that Pharaoh spoke to the midwives and told them to kill the male babies versus the time he commanded the people to kill their male babies. So right here it says, then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. Now we're going we're gonna to deal with who he spoke to. He spoke to 
the Hebrew midwives in verse 15 and 16. That's originally. After some passage of time, let's see who he spoke to. It says, so, so Pharaoh commanded all his people, all his people. We have Hebrew midwives versus all his people. Now, some of you have seen this and some of you have probably never seen this before because in verse 22, Pharaoh is not talking to just the Israelites. And this is huge. It says Pharaoh commanded all his people, not just his slaves, but all his people. A message... All right, so in other words, the message of infanticide originally spoken, right? Remember, it was spoken to the midwives, has now been commanded to whom? All his people, you see? So in other words, there's something that happened between verses 15 and 16 and verse 22. There has something, something has happened for sure. The, the Pharaoh of verse 15 and 16 who spoke only to Hebrew midwives is not the Pharaoh in verse 22 who commands all of his people, okay? Something has happened, all right? We don't know what it is. What has happened to change Pharaoh's focus? Because clearly in verses 15 and 16, his focus is solely upon the Hebrew children, okay? Whereas in verse 22, his focus is all the children. So we go from the Hebrew babies that are born to all of the babies that are born. So why has the plan changed and become more inclusive, you see? And in this way, I'm saying that the text is literally crying out to us and hinting to us that something happened. Uh, maybe it was just, may, it could have been just increasing and increasing frustration. I don't know, but think about, well, let's, let's go on to the, to the last point here. It says, then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, and he said, when you see the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, it, if, it's, if it is a son, right? <clears throat> In other words, these are only the Hebrew sons that are born that are to die. But in verse 22, so Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who was born. You, you see the increasing intensity of uh, Pharaoh's actions that we can see just by paying attention to the particular wording of the text. We're, we're going from Hebrew males versus Hebrew and Egyptian males, okay? Now, remember, the original plan was to thwart Israel, Israel's growth, okay? The original plan was to thwart Israel's growth. That's why he spoke to the Hebrew midwives and told them not to let the Hebrew babies uh, males live. But now Pharaoh is commanding all of his people saying every son who was born. So it's not just the Hebrew babies. So now why the question is why is he now behaving so desperately? Okay, because if you want to curb the growth of the Israelite people, it makes sense to kill their male babies. If that's your goal, if your only goal is to curb the growth of the Israelites, then it makes sense to kill Israelite male babies. But it does not make sense to kill his own male children, Egyptian male children. So I want to suggest to you that the text itself is suggesting that he is killing his own Egyptian male babies for some other reason, obviously, other than he's just trying to curb the population growth of the children of Israel. Okay? So the, the question hinted at by the text is why did Pharaoh begin killing all the male babies, including the Egyptian ones? I'm suggesting that this is the basis for the Midrashim. Remember the Midrash has said that astrologers came and told him that the uh, that the that the savior of the Israelites had, had been born and that they weren't sure whether he was Egyptian or Hebrew. Remember that? Remember from our Midrashim? Our Midrashim, they said that the astrologers came. And what I'm suggesting is that the text that we've just looked at from the scriptures 
clearly shows that Pharaoh was trying to kill all male babies, whether they were Hebrew or Egyptian. And that tells us that he was trying to do something other than just curb the population growth of the Israelites. And I'm suggesting to you that the Jewish sages saw this also, and they came up with this midrashim about astrologers who foretold the birth of their savior and that they would need to kill both male and female. Now, I'm not saying, listen to what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that that's what actually happened. I am saying, though, it is pretty fascinating that something did happen to change Pharaoh's plan, and it had nothing to do with just population curbing population growth of the Egyptians. And so what I'm suggesting is that this is the basis for the Midrashim. The Midrash about the astrologers foretelling the birth of Israel's Savior was written to fill in the details of why Pharaoh was killing all the male babies in Egypt. Okay? That's all. That's what it was about. So if the mid, so here we go. If the midrashim aren't true, then why? And we know they aren't. Okay, they're not. But why then are they so close close to the truth of the gospels? It's Remember, wonderful. we saw that earlier. The truth of the gospels, where um, men of the stars came announcing the birth of the king of the Jews, right? And that they had seen his star, and so. Why, why is that so? And then what was the basis for that midrash about the astrologers? What was that basis? And so what we're going to do is um, the next time that, that, that we meet, we're going to deal with that. But what have we learned so far today? We've learned that Exodus 1, 15 through 22 is written chiastically. That means that it is written in a thematic pattern, not just chronologically, but in themes, thematic patterns. We've learned that the text itself hints that something happened which caused Pharaoh to kill even Egyptian male babies. And we've surmised that it cannot be uh, the same reason or motive as when he originally uh, uh, spoke to the midwives that they killed the Hebrew male babies. There has to be a different reason. Okay? Oops. And we've also learned that the Midrashim were written to fill in the details of some stories, okay? They're not to be taken literally, they're not true, but although they're made of, they do have a biblical basis in that they are based on clear thematic connections to other passages in the scripture. And we've also seen that sometimes Midrashim are sometimes close to Messianic truth. Why? Because the masters of the Midrash were clearly making thematic connections to passages which Adonai intended them to. That's why. Okay? The reason why the Midrashim in many instances are close to Messianic truth is because Adonai intend because they were making thematic connections. And they were making thematic connections to other Messianic passages, okay? that Adonai intended them to, it's just that they didn't see the whole picture. They were dealing with the shadow. And then once Yeshua came and gave us the full image, now we're able to go back and see that they were very close in their analysis, and, and rightly they should have been. Um, you know, the fact that they made all these midrashim and these embellished stories, um, that's just another topic. Uh, yeah, that's, that's just another topic as to whether or not they should have done it that way or whatnot. But the truth is that uh, they were the that the scriptures themselves are the basis for those midrashim, even though even though they're not true, and that's why many times the midrash is actually close to messianic truth. So that was part two. We're going to have one more, and in the and then the last teaching, what we're going to do is we're going to provide, we're going to we're going to discover the text that was used. Uh, to come up with the midrash about astrologers coming and uh, foretelling the birth of the of the Israelite redeemers. So may Adonai and I bless you in the name of Yeshua. I hope that uh, this has helped you again uh, with how to study thematically and uh, to see the gems and the truths that Adonai and I has for us. So may Adonai and I bless you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Joy.